Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the ICNC Academic Webinar Series with Mary King, author and professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at the UN Affiliated University for Peace and an ICNC Academic Advisor. My name is David Reinbold, and I am the coordinator of Digital Initiatives at the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. In this webinar, award winning uh, nonviolent resistance scholar and U.S. civil rights vet uh, veteran Mary King will discuss her most recent book, which explores Gandhian nonviolent action and untouchability in South India. In the Indian village of Icom, now in Kerala, India, a 1920s nonviolent struggle sought to open to everyone the roads surrounding the Brahmin temple. For centuries, almost anyone could walk these roads except for so-called untouchable Hindus. From April 1924 to November 1925, what Mohandas K. Gandhi called a Satyagraha was waged to gain access for excluded groups to the routes encircling the temple compound. As the 604-day campaign persisted, it gripped British India and beyond while revealing extreme forms of discrimination practiced by the upper castes, untouchability, unapproachability, and unseeability. The campaign, however, suffered from specific strategic shortcomings, which Mary King will discuss in depth in today's presentation. Today's webinar <clears throat> will be about an hour in length. It will be in two separate portions. The first portion is a presentation that will last about 30 minutes or so with Mary, and the final portion will be a Q&A session in which you can ask your questions. And with that, we'll hand over controls to Mary and provide a brief introduction to her. Soon after graduating from Ohio Wesleyan University, Mary King went to work for the civil rights movement, first in Atlanta and then in Mississippi, serving on the staff of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She has built her academic specialty on the study of nonviolent civil resistance and is acclaimed as a top authority on the subject. She is now a professor of peace and conflict studies at the UN affiliated University for Peace in Costa Rica. She's also a distinguished Rothmore American Institute fellow at the University of Oxford. King is the author of many books, including Freedom Song, a personal story of the 1960 civil rights movement, A Quiet Revolution, the first Palestinian Intifada and nonviolent resistance, and her latest book, Gandhian Nonviolent Struggle and Untouchability in South India, the 1924 to 1925 Vaikam Satyagraha and the mechanisms of change. King has served in the Carter administration with worldwide oversight for the Peace Corps and for the domestic VISTA program and other national volunteer service programs. For her work on the theory and practice of nonviolent action and in peace education, King has been awarded the Jamnalal Bajaj International Prize, the El Hebri Peace Education Prize, and the James Lawson Award for Nonviolent Achievement. She is the recipient of honorary degrees from her alma mater, Ohio Wesleyan University, Naberwistwith University in Wales, United Kingdom, where she did her doctoral work in international politics. Um, and with that, Mary, you can now begin your webinar, please. Well, thank you so much, David. Welcome, everyone. Let's get started. Fifteen years ago, the scholar Jean Sharp suggested to me that I needed to do some work. He said, I suspect that almost everything we think we know about the 1920s BICOM struggle is wrong. I went to work to see what I could find, and I was given a great deal of support along the way. The Rodemir American Institute at Oxford gave me a travel grant, and I was able to get into the Kerala State Archives and could see that what Jean had told me was right. There was absolutely no substantiation for what had appeared in print. The United States Institute of Peace gave me a grant that allowed me to travel back to India, and I spent hundreds of hours in the archives over a period of years working on this project. Dinu, Anna, Matthew, and Professor Vasu Tillery have my profound thanks. These are two Carolyn scholars who were vital to my being able to translate documents and newspapers from the Malayalam language, which is the language of Kerala. I also had help over those 15 years from the Institute of Social Sciences in New Delhi and its founder and chair, Dr. George Matthew. And I was also helped by Christopher Miller on much of the research during the time, particularly, that I was working at Oxford. This book is based on original research in archives and newspaper war morgues. These are actual photographs of the um, newspapers at the Madrabhumi newspaper uh, near Calicut. This means motherland. And I spent hundreds of hours sweating in, 
in this and other morgues, let me say a word about my methodology. I use triangulation. I was trying to find three separate sources for every assertion that I made, but want them to come from different types of sources. So I would hope that they would come from archives, newspapers, interviews, uh, original documents, secondary documents in some cases in the Kerala Historical Society, and um, also interviewing people who had known people who participated in this struggle. This is uh, uh, Vasu Tillery was of enormous help to me, a local historian. And um, we worked together over two separate periods extensively. I also interviewed um, quite a few historians, social scientists, and journalists. One meeting took place at the Institute of Social Sciences in 2009. Uh, I was enabled to do what I did in the Kerala State Archives because Dina Anu Matthew was helping me. She is now a doctoral candidate at the University for Peace. This is a picture of her taken during a recent lecture tour in Kerala uh, in September. She's sitting right up front. And uh, without her, I could not have done the book. Our story takes place in the princely state of Travancore. It was 90 years ago, a 20-month nonviolent struggle in what is now Kerala that sought to open to everyone the road surrounding the Brahmin temple there. For centuries, almost anyone or any animal, a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a dog, a pig, anyone, could walk the temple roads, except for the so-called untouchable Hindus, who would pollute the high castes should their shadow fall upon them. Public roads had notice boards that were maintained by the Maharaja's government in Travancore prohibiting use by those who had no caste. The distances of the notices were based on theoretical pollution of the pure upper castes. From, eight, from April 1924 until November 1925, what Gandhi called a satyagraha was waged to gain access for ex excluded groups to these roads encircling the temple compound. Satyagraha was a word that he coined, meaning basically uh, nonviolent civil resistance, although in, um, uh, in the course of his coining the word, it more literally means uh, relentless pursuit of truth. Travancore Princely State had been educating untouchables since the 19th century. Gandhi called Travancore a golden garden. This is a photograph showing very much what the entire state of Kerala looks like. It's lush, verdant, green, 170 miles long from north to south, and 75 miles wide, crisscrossed by waterways and creeks. Kerala became a state in 1956, and it was comprised of Travancore Princely State, another princely state called Cochin, and the Malabar district, which was part of British India. Travancore comprised most of Kerala's southern portion. Just so that you have a grasp, in 1875, the first scientific census had counted 2.3 million population in, Traven in, uh, in, in Kerala, in, in Travancore princely state, sorry, that, that is the the population then of Travancore. A few words about the Hindu caste system. The important thing to remember is that untouchables are not cast out of society. They, they, they were not in it. And this is a paraphrase of a missionary record that I found. The caste system took thousands of years to develop a hierarchy related to the theoretical degrees of purity. It was instituted around about 500 years before the Common Era or before Christ. In uh, Travancore, Brahmins were called Nambudris. You can see this word, Nambudri. They were the largest landlords in Travancore, but they were only 2% of the population. 
something extremely important for you to remember, um, and I'm grateful to Professor Narayanan for pointing this out to me very early in my study. In Travancore, most of the Nambudri Brahmins were not priests, they were landlords. He says he's indebted to Marxist historians for understanding this fact. It's a terribly important background fact. Nair's were the next on the caste system rung. This is the warrior and ca chieftain caste, the largest landholders, land managers, 20% of the population or one-fifth, civil servants, managing the land, worked by laborers, outcasts, and slaves. The Sanskrit word for caste is varna, which means color. There were four main castes that comprised Savarnas. We are going to be talking about Avarnas, those without a varn, also called outcasts, probably a term coined by the British. They were also called Harijans, a term coined by Gandhi, meaning children of God. And they were also called and are Dalits. This name comes from the Marathi language of Maharashtra. Uh, from Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's place of origin. He was one of the great leaders of the untouchables. Dalits, another name for untouchables used widely today, including people who are oppressed having nothing to do with caste. And what it means in his language of origin, Marathi, is broken men. 25% of the population were Savarna at the time of our story, and 40% were Avarna. All over India, untouchability was found. What you need to keep in mind is that two other forms were found only in South India, and that is unapproachability, in which people had to call out from a prescribed distance, 36 meters, 90 meters, depending upon how low you were in the social rankings. You had to call out to alert a high caste person that you were approaching them on the road so that they could avoid being polluted by their shadow falling on you. And unseeability. The unseeables were primarily from former serf and slave castes, which uh, in the 19th century had been about 15% of Travancore's population. And the unseeables could only come out at night so that they would not be seen. They lived in ditches and um, out-of-the-way places. In 1817, the Maharani Gauri Parvati Bai, who was the sovereign ruler of Travancore and head of the royal family, issued a proclamation for universal education. In, uh, in, in her action, it made it possible for untouchables to begin getting educated at an early stage. In 1855, a royal proclamation ended slavery. By 1904, Travancore princely state was paying the costs for primary education of backward castes. Let me explain the word Maharani. Maharaja means great king. Raja meaning king, Maha meaning great. Maharani means great queen. The senior uh, head of the royal family and the uh, the, the person from whom both sovereignty and inheritance was transmitted for the royal family was the Rani. And so Maharani was great queen. This is uh, a painting of her. The Aravas were the largest group of Hindus who had no caste. They were originally Buddhist immigrants from a period before Christ or before the Common Era from Sri Lanka. Arava or Irava means people from Ceylon. As newcomers in an ancient land, they had no caste. By 1921, however, only about 3% of Aravas were still tapping toddy, which is what they had historically done through the centuries, as you can see from this photograph. Uh, you can see an Arava who's scaling a tree. It could have been coconut, sago, or palmyra and then the sap would be fermented into an alcoholic drink. The Arabas were actually the second largest group in the princedom. 
they paid more taxes than any other groups. But by the 1920s, there were many educated elites. And they were also small business owners. Their growing middle class wanted government jobs and influence. T.K. Modavin, whom you see, this is a sketch that I had commissioned of a statue that now stands in his honor in the village of Vicom. T.K. Madovan is the person who actually was the originator of the Vicom struggle. He is the one who sought out Gandhi. He was disgusted with petitions, fed up. The Arabas had been submitting petitions to the Maharaja and the palace since at least 1884. In 1896, for example, there was a petition submitted with 13,176 signatures of Aravas only. Madhavan became enthralled by Gandhi, and he believed that he would have an endless number of methods that he could use to help the Aravas gain the status and influence and end to untouchability that they sought. In 1923, an anti-untouchability committee was formed by the Indian Congress Party. Madhavan got Gandhi's blessings after his initial hesitation for the Aravas to begin organizing to enter temples in Travancore. In point of fact, most of the struggle that we're talking about was only for access to the roads. And um, uh, temple entry would not come until much later. So the local was being made national. In 1920, in Nagpur, right in the center of India, those of you familiar with the work of the Reverend Dr. James Lawson know that he spent three years teaching in a college in Nagpur in the 1950s, right in the center of India. There was a meeting of the National Congress, Indian National Congress Party in 1920. It passed a resolution giving access, calling for access for untouchables into all temples. Gandhi's program of nonviolent non-cooperation was also at that time adopted as core national policy. In Bardoli in 1922, the Congress Party also adopted the co constructive program, a very significant part of Gandhi's thinking. It would involve uh, eradication of untouchability, uplift of the Harijans, promotion of hand looming, wearing of khadi. Uh, constructive program actually came to mean more to Gandhi than resistance in his later years. But at this time, Gandhi was wary, cautious, and conservative. He was very worried about the princedoms being sucked into the imperial system. The Satyagraha, after much planning, began on March 30, 1924. In fact, there could have been still more planning, as you will soon see. This is a sketch of three of the first volunteers approaching the bamboo barricades that had been erected by the Maharaja's government and supervised by uh, the British police uh, and by the British resident, about whom you'll hear more. Um, three volunteers approached the barriers, which were called Tindal Palakas. Tindal means those who could pollute. And this was considered contagious, by the, by the way. The high caste, Nair, is fully clothed. He's in the back. In the front, conspicuous by their lack of clothing, are the outcasts or the untouchables. Uh, Puleya, formerly slave outcast, and an Arava. Their costumes showed anyone approaching them that they were untouchables. The district magistrate issued a prohibitory order against the opening of the temple roads. When Madhavan and the key upper caste leaders arrived, they were arrested. The magistrate's order actually changed the march to implicit civil disobedience. Three marchers had been arrested the first day, and another three would be knocked, locked up the next day, and um, soon there would be 19 in prison. Interestingly, I can tell from the correspondence from the palace at the time that the palace and the government were really only disturbed about discrepancies in their policies. They were not concerned about the cruelties of untouchability, unapproachability, or unseeability.
Now, the 19 imprisoned leaders sent for Periyar, which means Great One, E.V. Ramasamy Niker of a road from the next door state of Tamil Nadu. He was a major social reformer of South India and an ardent orator. In the Paris palace correspondence, you can see many complaints about his uh, inciting uh, the people with his fiery speeches. With 19 key leaders behind bars, it meant a profound vacuum in the struggle from which it would never recover. There was no grand strategy. Things proceeded from individual initiatives. There was no sense of sequencing. Gandhi is advising from afar by telegram and letter. But the leadership quandaries were many. Excessively optimistic planning for converting the upper caste left the campaign directionless. I'll say more about conversion in a minute. Violence would soon be inflicted by agents of the temple uh, officials. In July to August, monsoons that were written up in the newspapers as the worst in human memories created a problem for the volunteers. They maintained their vigils because they were seeking to convert or to touch, to reach the hearts and minds of the high caste. This is the way that Gandhi believed and hoped that change would occur. So in maintaining their, their vigils, they had a very difficult time because the water rose to waist height by morning, and by afternoon it was at shoulder height. This is a sketch based on newspaper accounts of what it was like near to the police headquarters. Um, Police were in boats protecting the barricades. The volunteers also had to be ferried into where they would maintain their vigil. Temple official boats often struck volunteers. One volunteer drowned in attempting a rescue. This flood is now called the Great Flood of 1924, however, because the rains forced all levels to work together to manage the disaster. It thereby came to contribute to the emerging caste-based modernity movements. There were movements seeking to modernize and democratize. And they actually gained from the fact that the high caste sometimes had to interact in a different way because of the water. Gandhi proposed that two grand processions of high caste Nambudri Brahmins walk to the t capital and present what he called monster petitions. And so on November 1, 1924, led by Manas Padmanabhan Pillai, a great procession called a Savarna Jata proceeded and uh, walked to Trivandrum, the capital. This is a map showing the two grand processions that I asked uh, uh, the historian Basu Tillery to help with, along with the gentleman who did these sketches. The group setting out from Vicom was about 100 strong. But over the course of walking this distance to the capital at Trivandrum, their numbers would grow to thousands. 500 set out from Qatar in the south, and their numbers would also swell. There were heavy rains, and yet they walked in military formation. Uh, there was very extensive planning that was now in evidence. And W.H. Pitt, who was the British police commis commissioner, had reduced the armed detachments. Untouchability, the Anti-Untouchability Committee in 1923 had been gathering signatures and recruiting the marchers. And en route, the high caste violated the interdining caste restrictions by accepting snacks from untouchables. They did this deliberately to break the protocols. Upon arriving at Travancore, a 12-member delegation presented the monster petitions in an audience with the Maharani regent. This is, of course, another Maharani from the one we heard about earlier. You already know that the Royal House of Travancore was following matrilineal inheritance systems which dated actually to the 10th or 11th century, in which both sovereignty and inheritance passed from the senior Rani, a woman. 
Um, and September 1st, Setu Lakshmi Bai had been installed as the, as the Maharani regent, and she ruled approximately 4 million by then population in Travancore. She was acting for her nephew, who would become Maharaja in seven years. The deputation here is presenting these 25,000 signatures ardently gathered by the Anti-Untouchability Committee. And one of the Maharani's first acts was to release the, 20, the first 20 leaders that had been arrested and locked up for all of this time. In March of 1925, Gandhi traveled by train and arrived in Travancore to speak against untouchability and also to promote the Congress Nationalist program. This was probably Gandhi's first personal encounter with the severe prejudices of the high caste orthodoxies found in South India, unapproachability and unseeability. I find no trace that he had ever encountered this before. Now, he also met with Sri Narayana Guru, who was an Arava and considered by many the greatest social reformer and leader in South India. And in 1903, Guru had founded a leading self-help Dalit organization. This meeting with the talk of Travancore in the newspapers, Guru went ahead and supported the Vaikam Satyagraha, but he was quite ambivalent about Gandhi's nonviolent action. He was baffled by Gandhi's desire to invoke suffering by the volunteers. He didn't accept the concept of self-suffering as a way of converting the high caste. He said, there's no endurance. There's just empty stomachs. Why not use an umbrella under downpours? You should demand that injustice be addressed. Go ahead and break the barricades. Pollute the upper caste. If the police beat you, that's a test of endurance not standing in floods. Now, you remember that I mentioned W.H. Pitt, the British um, police commissioner. He was accompanying Gandhi throughout this visit. Gandhi was a state guest of the Maharaja. The better to control him, I learned from palace correspondence. Uh, the Maharaja believed that, uh, the, the, sorry, the palace officials believed that he would be more cooperative if he were a state guest. Gandhi met for three hours with temple authorities who rejected his three proposals. Local people told me that Gandhi was kept standing at the door, which is what this sketch depicts. He nearly prostrated himself before the orthodox leaders. He offered for them to choose their own pandits, a Hindi word meaning learned interpreters of Sanskrit, and said that he would accept the Pandit's scriptural interpretation on untouchability. This is, by the way, where we get our English word pundit. Everything that Gandhi put forward was rejected. And what you need to remember is at this time, reform movements were being organized based on unwritten religious precepts other than those held by Brahmins, very much like those led by Narayana Guru. And these were distinct from upper caste reform efforts, which got virtually no attention from Gandhi. On his departure, Gandhi gave a letter to Commissioner Pitt with a compromise based on their talks. The plan laid out that the government would remove the barricades on the temple roads that were installed in March 1924, but the volunteers would refrain from entering the forbidden roads. The Dalits um, were actually um, not going to be advanced very much by this plan, as you will soon see. Uh, yet by March 1925, Gandhi was now speaking in a different way. Instead of talking about melting hearts through self-suffering and efforts of moral suasion to convert the upper caste, he was now talking about force in the form of action. And he began speaking of compulsion and pressure. So Gandhi did make many mistakes. He had only returned from South Africa in 1915. This struggle started nine years later. Um, he had an enormous learning curve. Um, my students are always astonished 
because they can't understand why Gandhi ignored the self-help mobilizing being done by the untouchables themselves. In wanting Hindus to atone for their cruelty over centuries toward the outcasts, he rejected help from non-Hindus. He rejected outside funds. Syrian Christian families, still a very significant proportion of Kerala's population, are still to this day vexed by his asking a Syrian Christian leader, George Joseph, to leave. ICOM was uh, actually uh, the first modern struggle of India, but limiting the campaign constrained major democratic reform movements that were then galvanizing. He wanted the reforms, as I've mentioned, to come about because of conversion, which he spoke of as sheer force of character and suffering. He hoped that this silent and loving suffering would finally break the wall of prejudice. Um, now, his certainty that Satyagraha had failed if it were due to an insufficient discipline is actually, in my view, a very hazardous article of faith because it can lead to acceptance of deplorable repression. I'll say more about this. Perhaps the most stunning and controversial part of this entire struggle was the so-called settlement or the so-called compromise. Another lesson for today's organizers and research researchers comes from how this campaign ended. Nonviolent movements often have ragged endings. And Vicom's so-called settlement was extremely uh, ragged. The so-called compromise actually left the Dalits back where they had been at the start of the struggle. What the temple authorities did, and they were following the plan that Gandhi and the British police commissioner cooked up, was to add a diversion road at the eastern gate, which was the gate normally used by the temple officials. And that would allow the high castes to walk into the temple without being polluted by the site or being near any of the so-called untouchables. This is a picture of Vicom Temple today through the Eastern Gate. Now, Manas Padmanabha Pillai, whom you saw leading the grand processions, was probably the first upper caste figure in Travancore to take a public stand on ending touchability, untouchability in the Hindu caste system. He used his rank to confront the oppression faced by Dalits. Today, statues to him, T.K. Madhavan, and Ramasamy Naikar all stand in ICOM. And a center has been also added, a new memorial center with Gandhi's stroke statue. In 1936, the last Maharaja of Travancore would issue a proclamation it would throw open not only the temple roads, but all temples to all Hindus in Travancore. Even so, 11 miles remained forbidden to non-caste Hindus. So Gandhi actually probed social power very deeply. But he's on record more in talking about his ideas about moral suasion but careful parsing of what he says and writes shows that he was often thinking about the use of compulsion and pressure as a force exerted by human beings. He possibly spoke and wrote on untouchability more than any other subject. And I have a quote that I'd like to bring to your attention that comes from while he was still working in South Africa, 1905. Even the most powerful cannot rule without the cooperation of the ruled. This is a powerful and potent insight, and most of today's nonviolent movements are operating on the basis of that insight. Now, the misrepresentations of ICOM were many, and they have probably hurt the pathway of civil resistance. Because within a decade of the so-called settlement, serious analysts Richard Gregg, Joan Bondurant, Krishnalal Shri, Krishna Sridharani, and others were offering mythic explanations for what had happened in Vicom. It became the justification for the misperception that nonviolent struggle works by conversion of hearts and minds. 
via the self-suffering of challengers. The glorified reports of these scholars and others about VICOM all contain the same unattributed quotation. So we're dealing with very bad scholarship also. The quotation was, we cannot any longer resist the prayers that have been made to us, and we are ready to receive the untouchables. This is supposedly what the Nambudri Brahmins said. Um, but these exaggerated accounts probably have damaged the academic reception to this very significant historic method for exerting social power. And I can pledge to you that in hundreds of hours in archives and newspaper morgues and interviews of probably two dozen historians, journalists, and social scientists, I have found no substantiation for um, the conversion of the high castes, except in a very long-term roundabout sense. Human agency was actually with the associations that were organizing the Dalits themselves. But Gandhi gave priority to action aimed at the high castes. This, his overriding of local leaders, and his limiting of participation effectively compromised the expansion of the democratizing movements that were then being spawned in South India with great strength. They could have been stronger. Until 2005, the Kerala Department of Public Relations was actually bragging online that public opinion in the state was so favorable that the government had thrown open the approach roads to the Avarnas, those without caste. It has now, fortunately, been removed because there is no proof of this whatsoever. So why is this book important? Well, first of all, I think it's important to have it established that Gandhi's concept of conversion, except perhaps in a metaphorical sense, has not survived the test of time. Um, but I would say that uh, Gandhi was not afraid to criticize himself and that we should adopt his self-critical approach. But we do need to recognize a basic flaw in his presumptions on this matter. The notion of self-suffering, along with an uncritical belief that nonviolent action never fails and can melt the stoniest heart, is possibly quite dangerous. Not conversion, but other dynamics would bring alterations for the Dalits. And these would include the wider untouchability mobilizations, sweeping liberalizing and democratic ideas, the Maharaja's 1936 proclamation, and fear of untouchables converting to other religions. Also, Kerala was then and is today the most literate and educated state in India. So the effects of education were also felt. Uh, this book is the first verifiable chronology of what actually occurred in the Vaikam Satyagraha. But I believe that extolling a non-existent narrative in Vaikam has delayed and perhaps distorted deeper learning for nearly a century. And finally, I would say that overzealous advocacy or metaphysical explanations block understanding. This happened first with India and then later with the civil rights movement. Thanks to George Lakey and his work in the 1960s, amplified by other scholars, we have the mechanisms of change as an important analytical tool. Jean Sharp calls this four ways to achieve success. In my 20 years of face-to-face -face teaching with this tool, I've over and over and again had the experience that it results in a sudden penetrating insights as student realize, students realize that movements or campaigns can be aimed at certain outcomes. Equally, one can analyze what happened in the past. It answers. Uh, if, if you apply it, it can help to answer how can strategy be aimed, and it can also help to answer how has nonviolent action worked in a nonviolent struggle of the past. Lakey identified four mechanisms. Conversion, I would say that my research calls for redefining conversion as an ideal. It was never anything but rare. However, many of the substantiations for conversion were based on BICOM. So I think that we need to redefine it as saying,
Conversion is an ideal in the sense of bringing about attitudinal change. Nothing wrong with that. Accommodation. George Lakey calls this persuasion. Historically, this is what occurs in most nonviolent struggles. Certainly, this is what happened in the civil rights movement. Atlanta, a city too busy to hate. Signs of segregation coming down all over the South without press conferences and so on. Accommodation is the, the dominant mechanism. And nonviolent coercion, the targeted group is still entrenched, still seated. Their policies remain, but they can no longer run the system without the cooperation of the nonviolent challengers. And um, nonviolent disintegration, the collapse of the opponent's power system, we have seen this a number of times recently. And let me just say that Gandhi was sometimes able to change hearts and minds. In 1947, when Hussein Shahid Shrawadi, who was the Muslim chief minister of Bengal, and who had opposed Gandhi, made a sincere confession. And um, both Shurawati and Gandhi moved into the mansion of a Muslim widow in Calcutta. And by day, they would walk about the city streets, interacting with people. Their staying together and walking together became a turning point in subsidence of the Calcutta riots and remaining steps to independence. So certainly, Gandhi had changed Shirawati's hearts and minds. For four decades, African Americans were traveling to India, seeking strategies to alter what they saw as comparable to a caste system. Indians were also lecturing in the United States, bringing lessons from their campaigns. This direct transmission of knowledge, which has been documented by the historian Sudarshan Kapoor, also working through archival research, shows the, the, the coming contours of the US civil rights movement. Certain pockets of the black community in the United States by mid 20th century were very well advised about what was happening in India. And they were traveling by steamership to India. In 1936, the president of Morehouse College met with Gandhi. And this is where Martin Luther King first heard of Gandhi was in a chapel speech by the president of Morehouse College. So um, Gandhi also created the language with which all people in the English-speaking world today who are talking about civil resistance uh, are using. The terms that he coined are, are, are significant, important. They are the patois, the lexicon, the vocabulary of civil resistance all over the English-speaking world today, terms non-cooperation, non-violence, usually meaning a creed or belief, non-violent action, non-violent methods, non-violent revolution, non-violent conflict, civil resistance, sanctions. Speaking of this as a technique, method, or process of struggle, transformation of conflict, um, the only one on which there might be some ambiguity is civil disobedience. Uh, many people believe that Henry David Thoreau first used it, although so far as I know, um, he did not ever use it in print. It was added by his editors later. Well, before we move to the conclusion, let's balance our viewpoint. To me, Gandhi is possibly the greatest leader of the 20th century. In fact, I would say, for me, Gandhi is the greatest leader of the 20th century. Certainly, he is the first non-Western figure of the modern era to capture worldwide attention. He has given us the first comprehensive theory and praxis of nonviolent struggle. And his discernment of power principles underpins nonviolent struggles worldwide. The LICOM struggle teaches us the need to revisit ignored, forgotten, lost, or misrepresented struggles. LICOM is also an open invitation for students, researchers, scholars, and activists to begin excavating misperceived, neglected, overlooked, or erased campaigns that hold lessons for current or future nonviolent struggles. After midnight on August 15, 1947, India became an independent nation. The Constituent Assembly, with a committee headed by Dr. Ambedkar, passed a resolution outlawing the practice of untouchability, declaring it illegal in the Constitution. 
The New York Times, in its editorial, wrote, the idea of caste is not an Indian copyright, and compared India's decision to the abolition of transatlantic slavery. Now, let me just reflect for a moment, and I'm, here are some uh, snapshots from my recent lecture tour in India. And let me share with you what I shared along the way in New Delhi and Kerala that when civil resistance is chosen to fight deep-seated post-social pathologies like racism or untouchability, a settlement may actually be out of reach. The most charitable reading of the supposed VICOM compromise is to say that it may have involved management of conflict. I believe that we need many strategies for addressing the degradations of racism and untouchability. Perhaps perceiving these miseries as chronic diseases that require constant management is more um, to the point, because myriad evasions and concealments can mask prejudice and discrimination, as we know. We need to fight such humiliations every day and every hour. And so I often think about Let's look at racism and untouchability as a chronic disease that, re that requires constant vigilance. So that, David, will be the end of my presentation. And Mary, if you're ready, um, I do have some questions that have uh, come in during your presentation. Sure. OK, great. Um, so one of our participants wants to know, um, did you face criticism or threats in India or by Indians for the research you undertook for this book, um, which identifies some of Gandhi's mistakes? Well, this is a very interesting question. Um, everywhere I emphasize that Gandhi was very unafraid of criticizing himself. He would talk about Himalayan blunders, Himalayan mistakes. Um, and I think that that may have softened the edge. Um, at the book launch in New Delhi uh, with uh, uh, Meenakshi Gopinath, Professor Meenakshi Gopinath, um, uh, turned to me and said, uh, Professor King, if I did not know of how dedicated you were to the study of Gandhi, I would have thought that you might be speaking heresy. So I had some very interesting and intriguing comments to that effect. But basically, um, uh, to talk about Gandhi's errors is, is newsworthy in India. There have been so many people who used an overemphasis on extolling the virtues of Gandhi and overdramatizing um, the tremendous assets that he had brought to the world stage, that I think there may now be a readiness for people to look more analytically at what he did when he made errors. Let's look at them. We can look at them sympathetically. He was on a learning curve. We are all human. We are all capable of human frailty. We all need to judge ourselves. Only in one place, one in one place in particular, was somebody um, uh, very outspoken. Um, and what happened is that somebody in the audience stood up and uh, uh, said to the organizers of the event, "You should not let this person be speaking because he's not making sense." But by and large, I found great interest, tremendous amount of press interest. I don't know if I can go back to the uh, pictures, David. Is it possible? To go back to the last sure. Um, let me switch. Let me switch back over to you. Okay. Um, if you can see back here, these are banks of television cameras uh, at uh, the Column Public Library Hall in an annual Srivanathan Memorial Lecture and um, tremendous press interviews. Uh, two hour-long television interviews. Lots of print interviews. So there's tremendous interest and I think readiness to look um, uh, look at Gandhi's record in a more dispassionate way. I think we should not be afraid to learn from him. I think this is actually the best evidence of Gandhi's relevance, that we can look at what he did, where he made mistakes, and say, aha, we can learn from this. What could make him more relevant for today's organizers and activists than that? All right, great. Um, somebody else wants to know, um, in examining post-Bicom actions of Gandhi, would you say he learned from the mistakes of the Bicom movement? 
Did he adopt alterations to future actions or maintain a stance that conversion could succeed? Um, he, he, he continues to talk about conversion until the end of his days. Now, Nehru in, just interprets that as another word for um, uh, force or, for, or, or pressure. Or, um, but it, Gandhi did, I believe, learn from Viacom. He, he accentuates his conviction to work on, on untouchability. Uh, it's a very difficult struggle. He, um, is, he, is, he is in a relationship with Dr. Ambedkar in which he himself caused a misunderstanding. He had thought that Dr. Ambedkar was a high caste acting on behalf of untouchables. Did not realize that Dr. Ambedkar was himself an untouchable. And that set in train a long process of um, discontent uh, for many people, including both Ambedkar and Gandhi. Although um, Ambedkar did himself organize the Satyagraha in 1927, um, Gandhi never loses his intense concern and commitment to the eradication of untouchability. And in fact, he plays a critical role in getting Dr. Ambedkar to chair the committee of the Constituent Assembly that would bring about the outlawing of untouchability. Okay, great. Um, somewhat related to that, somebody wants to know, um, while Gandhi may have been misguided in his emphasis on conversion, do you think he was correct in his analysis that the untouchable community needed to include Brahmins in the movement in order for it to be effective? Well, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't the untouchables who were making the decisions in the movement. Um, the, the untouchables were very wary of participation. The, the social situation was so perilous for so-called untouchables at that time that we see very, very little evidence of actual participation of untouchables. You caught in the first at the start of the march, yes, there are some. But by and large, because volunteers are coming from all over India before Gandhi sends them home, they are from all ranks of the society. Gandhi even sent back to the Punjab a group of Sikh reformers who were running the canteen to feed the satyagrahis. Um, there's certainly strategic reason for aiming the struggle at the high caste Nambudri Brahmins. Certainly, that made excellent sense. My criticism has to do with the fact that it was exclusively aimed in that way and that it excluded the fraternal efforts of anti-caste, anti-untouchability movements that had been forming for decades and that were mobilizing with tremendous uh, success and a marvelous um, agility in South India. And, and they, they were left outside. Um, there are untouchables, Ramasaki Naikar, whom I mentioned, in the end become so disgusted with Gandhi's compromising attitude that he leaves the Congress party and determines to work uh, on uplift for the lower caste through his own devices. Um, there are other untouchable leaders who have nothing to do with ICOM, and there's every good reason to believe that it was the fact that Gandhi insisted on pitching the struggle solely at the high caste that was involved. Regrettably, in the archives, the Kerala State Archives, there are no records from the volunteers that have survived. My hope is that the Panchayat Raj, this is the local governing councils established by India's 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment, which require a very high percentage of women to be elected. My hope is that they will now begin investigating local histories and may turn up some additional original documents uh, that we can revise our estimates of what the lower caste might have been doing. Incidentally, women become active in about April of the struggle. And I have a section in the book on women, although with untouchability, unapproachability, and unseeability, you would not expect to find very much participation of women. The uh, conditions for the lower caste women were very low, but there definitely are, are 
upper caste women who become involved, at many of them are from next door Tamil Nadu. All right, great. Um, somebody has their hand raised. I'm going to go ahead. Um, let's see. Where it is? Michael, did you have a question? Hello, did you have a question? Uh, okay. All right, so I guess we're just going to go back to you asking um, other questions. Um, somebody writes, um, I'm from Tamil Nadu. I know that untouchability still exists, um, but it is not as bad as it once was. The question is, what do you think the leaders of the movement could have done to convert more people um, and to change the mindset and attitude of our grandparents? Well, that's such an interesting question, and of course it's hypothetical, so I'm limited in the answer that I can give to it. But um, the, the conclusion that I draw about the, um, uh, the, the flattening effects that Gandhi's uh, uh, targeting, almost exclusive targeting of the high caste and ignoring the anti-untouchability movements that were coalescing all through South India, the, you know, the SNDP Yogam led by Sri Narayana Guru and other movements, I, I was, it was pointed out to me by so many people, including, Dave, David, can I go back to the photograph? I want to point out one person in particular, if I could point out, thank you. Sure, yeah. This is prof good. This is Professor Pillai, who um, is uh, uh, a principal of the Postgraduate College of Communications and Management and a director of the Jawahal Nehru Academy of Languages. But the reason I point to him is because, oh dear, I'm sorry, I've just had a little switch. Let me go to that photograph. Um, the reason I am pointing to him is because I was able to interview him extensively. He grew up in Vicom and he knew many, many people who were participants in the struggle. And he gave me a great deal of first-hand information. His headmaster, for example, suffered from injuries for the rest of his life as a result of being beaten uh, by the, uh, uh, the, the agents of the temple uh, authorities that were sent to beat the Satyagrahis. But based on, on things that Professor Pillai told me, uh, about the people that he knew and his family, experiences that he had had, I think that India might have been set on an even more dynamic course. Kerala might have been set on an even more dynamic course. Tamil Nadu might have been even more dynamically set on a dynamic course to bring about the democratization um, had there been interaction between the Vicom struggle and these other anti-untouchability movements. Although I have to say, as a, a, a side comment, that there's absolutely no way that we can write Gandhi out of what happened eventually with the Maharaja's proclamation in 1936, because there were other satyagrahas that took place in this area. There were at least three in the years following Vicom. They never succeeded in attracting widespread popularity as at Vicom. Newspapers all over Asia are reporting about the Vicom struggle during those two years. They never succeeded in getting the kind of focused all India attention that you can tell from national newspapers that there was at that time. And I believe that the reason that they did not is because they had no Gandhi. So the one thing affects another. Gandhi was needed in order to bring about that all India understanding that there were pernicious, extreme, severe forms of discrimination and prejudice in South India. Um, but by virtue of including Gandhi, he had certain ways that he wanted to do things. He was still trying to test Satyagraha. He thought he was returning to India with an answer for major social overhaul. And um, he had not been back very long. 
and he would make certain mistakes in trying to do that. So with one thing you get another. That's the best that I can say. Let me, while I'm on this picture, I just want to show you that in Viacom, I was given by Mr. M.A. Baby, who is a former Kerala State Minister of Education, now in opposition, and other uh, local officials. I was given a shawl made of cloth of gold, which is now one of my most prized possessions. And here is Mr. Baby, another, another official and myself, standing in front of the new memorial center at FICOM. And of course, you can recognize Gandhi um, by his um, uh, posture and garb. He's wearing the hand-loomed khadi, uh, which was part of his constructive program. 